St. Augustine's Confessions, Book 4, Confessions 1. During the space of those nine years, from the 19th to the 28th year of my life, I was led astray myself and led others astray in my turn. We were alike deceivers and deceived in all our different aims and ambitions, both publicly when we expounded our so-called liberal ideas, and in private, through our service to what we called religion. In public, we were cocksure, in private, superstitious, and everywhere, void and empty. On the one hand, we would hunt for worthless popular distinctions, the applause of an audience, prizes for poetry, or quickly fading wreaths won in competition. We loved the idle pastimes of the stage and in self-indulgence we were unrestrained. On the other hand, we aspired to be purged of these lowly pleasures by taking food to the holy elect, as they were called, so that in their paunches it might pass through the process of being made into angels and gods who would set us free. These were the objects I pursued and the tasks I performed together with friends who, like myself and through my fault, were under the same delusion. Let the proud deride me, O God, and all whom you have not yet laid low and humiliated for the salvation of their souls. But let me still confess my sins to you for your honour and glory. Allow me, I beseech you, to trace again in memory my past deviations and to offer you a sacrifice of joy. Without you, I am my own guide to the brink of perdition. And even when all is well with me, what am I but a creature suckled on your milk? and feeding on yourself the food that never perishes. And what is any man, if he is only man? Let the strong and mighty laugh at men like me. Let us, the weak and the poor, confess our sins to you. Confessions 2 During those years, I was a teacher of the art of public speaking. Love of money had gained the better of me, and for it I sold to others the means of coming off the better in debate. But you know, Lord, that I prefer to have honest pupils, insofar as honesty has any meaning nowadays. And I had no evil intent when I taught the tricks of pleading, for I never meant them to be used to get the innocent condemned, but if the occasion arose, to save the lives of the guilty. From a distance, my God, you saw me losing my foothold on this treacherous ground, but through clouds of smoke you also saw a spark of good faith in me. For though, as I schooled my pupils, I was merely abetting their futile designs and their schemes of duplicity, nevertheless I did my best to teach them honestly. In those days I lived with a woman, not my lawful wedded wife, but a mistress whom I had chosen for no special reason, but that my restless passions had alighted on her. But she was the only one, and I was faithful to her. Living with her, I found out by my own experience the difference between the restraint of the marriage alliance, contracted for the purpose of having children, and a bargain struck for lust, in which the birth of children is begrudged, though if they come we cannot help but love them. I remember too that once when I had decided to enter a competition for reciting dramatic verse, a sorcerer sent to ask me how much I would pay him to make certain that I won. I loathed and detested these foul rites and told him that even if the price were a crown of gold that would last forever, I would not let even a fly be killed to win it. For he would have slaughtered living animals in his ritual and by means of these offerings he would have pretended to invoke the aid of his demons in my favour. But, O oh God of my heart, it was not from a pure love of you that I rejected this wickedness. I had not learnt how to love you, for when I thought of you I imagined you as some splendid being, but entirely physical. Does not the soul which pines for such fantasies break its troth with you? Does it not trust in false hopes and play shepherd to the wind? But while I would not let this man offer sacrifice for me to his devils 
all the time I was offering myself as a sacrifice to them because of my false beliefs. For if we play shepherd to the wind, we find pasture for the devils, because by straying from the truth we give them food for laughter and fill their cup of pleasure. Confessions 3 The same reasoning did not prevent me from consulting those impostors, the astrologers, because I argued that they offered no sacrifices and said no prayers to any spirit to aid their divination. Nevertheless, true Christian piety rightly rejects and condemns what they do. For sweet it is to praise the Lord and say, Have mercy on me. Bring healing to a soul that has sinned against you. And it is wrong to impose upon your readiness to forgive, taking it as license to commit sin. Instead, we must remember our Lord's words to the cripple. You have recovered your strength. Do not sin any more, for fear that worse should befall you. This truth is our whole salvation, but the astrologers try to do away with it. They tell us that the cause of sin is determined in the heavens and we cannot escape it, and that this or that is the work of Venus or Saturn or Mars. They want us to believe that man is guiltless, flesh and blood though he is, and doomed to die despite his pride. Instead, they have it that the blame is to be laid on the creator and ruler of the heavens and the stars, none other than our God, himself the very source of justice from whom its sweetness is derived. On you, O God, who will award to every man what his acts have deserved, you, who will never disdain a heart that is humbled and contrite. There was at that time a man of deep understanding who had an excellent reputation for his great skill as a doctor. As he was proconsul at the time, his was the hand that laid upon my head the wreath I won in the poetry competition, but it was not a doctor's hand that could cure my disordered state of mind. This is a disease that only you can cure, you who thwart the proud and keep your grace for the humble. But you did not fail to use even that old man to help me, nor did you cease to give my soul through him the medicine which it needed. He and I became better acquainted, and I listened intently and without fail to what he had to say, for though he was not a gifted speaker, his lively mind gave weight and charm to his words. In the course of our conversation, he learned that I was an enthusiast for books of astrology, and in a kind and fatherly way, he advised me to throw them away and waste no further pains upon such rubbish, because there were other, more valuable things to be done. He said that as a young man he has studied astrology himself, intending to make a living by it, and that if he could understand Hippocrates I need not doubt that he had been able to master these textbooks as well. All the same after a time he had given them up and taken to medicine instead, for the very good reason that he had found out that they were entirely wrong, and being an honest man he had no wish to earn his living by deception. But you can support yourself by your rhetoric, he went on. Your interest in this trickery is mere curiosity, and you do not have to depend upon it for a living. All the more reason, then, why you should believe what I say, because, as it was to be my only means of support, I try to learn as much about it as I could. I asked him why it was then that the future was often correctly foretold by means of astrology. He gave me the only possible answer, that it was all due to the power of chance, a force that must always be reckoned within the natural order. He said that people sometimes opened a book of poetry at random, and although the poet had been thinking, as he wrote, of some quite different matter, it often happened that the reader placed his finger on a verse which had a remarkable bearing on his problem. It was not surprising then 
that the mind of man, quite unconsciously, through some instinct or within its own control, should hit upon some thing that answered to the circumstances and the facts of a particular question. If so, it would be due to chance, not to skill. This answer which he gave me, or rather which I heard from his lips, must surely have come from you, my God. By means of it, you imprinted on my mind doubts which I was to remember later when I came to argue these matters out for myself. But at that time, neither he nor my great friend, Nebridius, a young man of high principles and unexceptionable character, who ridiculed the whole business of soothsaying, could persuade me to give it up. I thought that the authors of the books made out a better case, and I had as yet found no evidence as positive as I required to prove beyond doubt that when the astrologers were found to be right, it was due to luck or pure chance and not to their skill in reading the stars. Confessions 4 during those years, when I first began to teach in Thagust, my native town, I had found a very dear friend. We were both the same age, both together in the heyday of youth and both absorbed in the same interests. We had grown up together as boys, gone to school together and played together. Yet ours was not the friendship which should be between two friends, either when we were boys or at this later time. For though they cling together, no friends are true friends unless you, my God, bind them fast to one another through that love which is sown in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given to us. Yet there was sweetness in our friendship, mellowed by the interests we shared. As a boy he had never held firmly or deeply to the true faith, and I had drawn him away from it to believe in the same superstitious, soul-destroying fallacies which brought my mother to tears over me. Now as a man, he was my companion in error, and I was utterly lost without him. Yet in a moment, before we had reached the end of the first year of a friendship that was sweeter to me than all the joys of life as I lived it then, you took him from this world. For you are the God of vengeance, as well as the fountain of mercy, you follow close behind the fugitive and recall us to yourself in ways we cannot understand. No man can count your praises, even though he is but one man and reckons only the blessings he has received in his own life. How can I understand what you did at that time, my God? How can I plumb the unfathomable depth of your judgment? My friend fell, gravely ill, of a fever. His senses were numbed as he lingered in the sweat of death, and when all hope of saving him was lost, he was baptized as he lay unconscious. I cared nothing for this, because I chose to believe that his soul would retain what it had learnt from me, no matter what was done to his body when it was deprived of sense. But no such thing happened. New life came into him and he recovered. And as soon as I could talk to him, which was as soon as he could talk to me, for I never left his side since we were so dependent on each other, I tried to chaff him about his baptism, thinking that he too would make fun of it, since he had received it when he was quite incapable of thought or feeling. But by this time, he had been told of it. He looked at me in horror as though I were an enemy, and in a strange, new-found attitude of self-reliance, he warned me that if I wished to be his friend, I must never speak to him like that again. I was astonished and confused, but I did not tell him what I felt, hoping that when he was better and had recovered his strength, he would be in a condition to listen to what I had to say. But he was rescued from my folly and taken into your safekeeping for my later consolation. For a few days after this, while I was away from him, the fever returned and he died. My heart grew somber with grief, and wherever I looked, 
I saw only death. My own country became a torment, and my own home a grotesque abode of misery. All that we had done together was now a grim ordeal without him. My eyes searched everywhere for him, but he was not there to be seen. I hated all the places we had known together because he was not in them and they could no longer whisper to me, here he comes, as they would have done had he been alive but absent for a while. I had become a puzzle to myself, asking my soul again and again, why are you downcast? Why do you distress me? But my soul had no answer to give. If I said, wait for God's help, she did not obey. And in this she was right because to her, the well-loved man whom she had lost was better and more real than the shadowy being in whom I would have her trust. Tears alone were sweet to me, for in my heart's desire they had taken the place of my friend. Confessions 5 But now, O Lord, all this is past, and time has healed the wound. Let the ears of my heart move close to your lips, and let me listen to you, who are the truth, so that you may tell me why tears are sweet to the sorrowful. Can it be that though you are present everywhere, you have thrust aside our troubles? You are steadfast, constant in yourself, but we are tossed on a tide that puts us to the proof. And if we could not sob our troubles in your ear, what hope should we have left to us? How then can it be that there is sweetness in the fruit we pluck from the bitter crop of life, in the mourning and the tears, the wailing and the sighs? Does their sweetness spring from hope, the hope that you will hear them? When we pray, this is truly so, because it is the purpose of prayer to reach your ear. But is it also true of sorrow for the things we lose and mourning such as then became my cloak? I had no hope that he would come to life again, nor was this what I begged for through my tears. I simply grieved and wept, for I was heartbroken and had lost my joy. Or is weeping too a bitter thing, becoming a pleasure only when the things we once enjoyed turn loathsome and only as long as our dislike for them remains? Confessions 6 But why do I talk of these things? It is time to confess, not to question. I lived in misery, like every man whose soul is tethered by the love of things that cannot last, and then is agonized to lose them. Only then does he realize the sorry state he is in, and was in even before his loss. In such a state was I at that time, as I wept bitter tears and found my only consolation in their very bitterness. This was the misery in which I lived, and yet my own wretched life was dearer to me than the friend I had lost. Gladly, though, I would have changed it. I was more loath to lose my life than I had been to lose my friend. True or not, the story goes that Orestes and Pylades were ready to die together for each other's sake, because each would rather die than live without the other. But I doubt whether I should have been willing, as they were, to give my life for my friend. I was obsessed by a strange feeling, quite the opposite of theirs, for I was sick and tired of living and yet afraid to die. I suppose that the great love which I had for my friend made me hate and fear death all the more, as though it were the most terrible of enemies, because it had snatched him away from me. I thought that just as it had seized him, it would seize all others too without warning. I still remember how these thoughts filled my mind. My heart lies before you, O oh my God. Look deep within. See these memories of mine, for you are my hope. You cleanse me when unclean humours such as these possess me by drawing my eyes to yourself and saving my feet from the snare. 
I wondered that other men should live when he was dead, for I had loved him as though he would never die. Still more I wondered that he should die and I remain alive, for I was his second self. How well the poet put it when he called his friend the half of his soul. I felt that our two souls had been as one, living in two bodies, and life to me was fearful because I did not want to live with only half a soul. Perhaps this too is why I shrank from death, for fear that one whom I had loved so well might then be wholly dead. Confession 7 What madness to love a man as something more than human. What folly to grumble at the lot man has to bear. I lived in a fever, convulsed with tears and sighs that allowed me neither rest nor peace of mind. My soul was a burden, bruised and bleeding. It was tired of the man who carried it, but I found no place to set it down to rest. Neither the charm of the countryside nor the sweet scents of a garden could soothe it. It found no peace in song or laughter, none in the company of friends at table or in the pleasures of love, none even in books or poetry. Everything that was not what my friend had been was dull and distasteful. I had heart only for sighs and tears, for in them alone I found some shred of consolation. But if I tried to stem my tears, a heavy load of misery weighed me down. I knew, Lord, that I ought to offer it up to you, for you would heal it. But this I would not do, nor could I, especially as I did not think of you as anything real and substantial. It was not you that I believed in, but some empty figment. The God I worshipped was my own delusion. And if I tried to find in it a place to rest my burden, there was nothing there to uphold it. It only fell and weighed me down once more, so that I was still my own unhappy prisoner, unable to live in such a state, yet powerless to escape from it. Where could my heart find refuge from itself? Where could I go, yet leave myself behind? Was there any place where I should not be a prey to myself? None. But I left my native town, for my eyes were less tempted to look for my friend in a place where they had not grown used to seeing him. So from Thagast, I went to Carthage. Confessions 8 Time never stands still, nor does it idly pass without effect upon our feelings or fail to work its wonders on the mind. It came and went, day after day, and as it passed, it filled me with fresh hope and new thoughts to remember. Little by little, it pieced me together again by means of the old pleasures which I had once enjoyed. My sorrow gave way to them but it was replaced, if not by sorrow of another kind, by things which held the germ of sorrow still to come. For the grief I felt for the loss of my friend had struck so easily into my inmost heart simply because I had poured out my soul upon him, like water upon sand, loving a man who was mortal, as though he were never to die. My greatest comfort and relief was in the solace of other friends who shared my love of the huge fable which I loved instead of you, my God, the long-drawn lie which our minds were always itching to hear, only to be defiled by its adulterous caress. But if one of my friends died, the fable did not die with him, and friendship had other charms to captivate my heart. We could talk and laugh together and exchange small acts of kindness. We could join in the pleasure that books can give. We could be grave or gay together. If we sometimes disagreed, it was without spite, as a man might differ with himself, and the rare occasions of dispute were the very spice to season our usual accord. Each of us had something to learn from the others and something to teach in return. 
If any were away, we missed them with regret and gladly welcomed them when they came home. Such things as these are heartfelt tokens of affection between friends. They are signs to be read on the face and in the eyes, spoken by the tongue and displayed in countless acts of kindness. They can kindle a blaze to melt our hearts and weld them into one. Confessions 9 This is what we cherish in friendship, and we cherish it so dearly that in conscience we feel guilty if we do not return love for love, asking no more of our friends than these expressions of goodwill. This is why we mourn their death, which shrouds us in sorrow and turns joy into bitterness, so that the heart is drenched in tears and life becomes a living death because a friend is lost. Blessed are those who love you, O God, and love their friends in you and their enemies for your sake. They alone will never lose those who are dear to them, for they love them in one who is never lost, in God, our God, who made heaven and earth and fills them with his presence, because by filling them he made them. No one can lose you, my God, unless he forsakes you. And if he forsakes you, where is he to go? If he abandons your love, his only refuge is your wrath. Wherever he turns, he will find your law to punish him, for your law is the truth, and the truth is yourself. Confessions 10 O God of hosts, restore us to our own. Smile upon us and we shall find deliverance. For wherever the soul of man may turn, unless it turns to you, it clasps sorrow to itself. Even though it clings to things of beauty, if their beauty is outside God and outside the soul, it only clings to sorrow. Yet these things of beauty would not exist at all unless they came from you. Like the sun, they rise and set. At their rise, they have their first beginning. They grow until they reach perfection. But once they have reached it, they grow old and die. Not all reach old age, but all alike must die. When they rise, therefore, they are set upon the course of their existence. And the faster they climb towards its zenith, the more they hasten towards the point where they exist no more. This is the law they obey. This is all that you have appointed for them, because they are parts of a whole. Not all the parts exist at once, but some must come as others go. And in this way, together, they make up the whole of which they are the parts. Our speech follows the same rule, using sounds to signify a meaning. For a sentence is not complete unless each word once its syllables have been pronounced, gives way to make room for the next. Let my soul praise you for these things, O God, creator of them all. But the love of them which we feel through the senses of the body must not be like glue to bind my soul to them. For they continue on the course that is set for them and leads to their end. And if the soul loves them and wishes to be with them and finds its rest in them, it is torn by desires that can destroy it. In these things there is no place to rest, because they do not last. They pass away beyond the reach of our senses. Indeed, none of us can lay firm hold of them, even when they are with us. For the senses of the body are sluggish, because they are the senses of flesh and blood. They are limited by their own nature. They are sufficient for the purposes for which they were made, but they cannot halt the progress of transient things which pass from their allotted beginning to their allotted end. All such things are created by your word, which tells them, here is your beginning and here your end. Confessions 11 My soul, you too must listen to the word of God. Do not be foolish.
Do not let the din of your folly deafen the ears of your heart, for the word himself calls you to return. In him is the place of peace that cannot be disturbed, and he will not withhold himself from your love unless you withhold your love from him. In this world, one thing passes away so that another may take its place and the whole be preserved in all its parts. But do I pass away elsewhere, says the word of God. Make your dwelling in him, my soul. Entrust to him whatever you have, for all that you have is from him. Now, at last, tired of being misled, entrust to the truth all that the truth has given to you, and nothing will be lost. All that is withered in you will be made to thrive again. All your sickness will be healed. Your mortal body will be refashioned and renewed and firmly bound to you, and when it dies it will not drag you with it to the grave, but will endure and abide with you before God, who abides and endures forever. My soul, why do you face about and follow the lead of the flesh? Turn forward and let it follow you. Whatever you feel through the senses of the flesh, you only feel in part. It delights you, but it is only a part, and you have no knowledge of the whole. To punish you, this just limit has been fixed for the senses of your body, but if this were not so and they could comprehend the whole, you would wish that whatever exists in the present should pass on, so that you might gain greater pleasure from the whole. It is one of these same bodily senses that enables you to hear the words I speak, but you do not want the syllables to sound forever in my mouth. You want them to fly from my tongue and give place to others, so that you may hear the whole of what I have to say. It is always the same with the parts that together make a whole. They are not present at the same time, but if they can all be felt as one, together they give more pleasure than each single part. But far better than these is he who made them all, our God. He does not pass away because there is none to take his place. Confessions 12 If the things of this world delight you, praise God for them, but turn your love away from them and give it to their maker, so that in the things that please you, you may not displease him. If your delight is in souls, love them in God, because they too are frail and stand firm only when they cling to him. If they do not, they go their own way and are lost. Love them, then, in him and draw as many with you to him as you can. Tell them he is the one we should love. He made the world and he stays close to it. For when he made the world, he did not go away and leave it. By him it was created and in him it exists. Wherever we taste the truth, God is there. He is in our very inmost hearts, but our hearts have strayed from him. Think well on it, unbelieving hearts, and cling to him who made you. Stand with him and you shall not fall. Rest in him and peace shall be yours. What snags and pitfalls lie before you? Where do your steps lead you? The good things which you love are all from God, but they are good and sweet only as long as they are used to do his will. They will rightly turn bitter if God is spurned and the things that come from him are wrongly loved. Why do you still choose to travel by this hard and arduous path? There is no rest to be found where you seek it. In the land of death you try to find a happy life. It is not there. How can life be happy where there is no life at all? Our life himself came down into this world and took away our death. He slew it with his own abounding life, and with thunder in his voice he called us from this world to return to him in heaven. From heaven he came down to us, entering first the virgin's womb, where humanity, our mortal flesh, was wedded to him so that he might not be forever mortal. Then as a bridegroom coming from his bed, he exulted like some great runner who sees the track before him. 
He did not linger on his way, but ran, calling us to return to him, calling us by his words and deeds, by his life and death, by his descent into hell and his ascension into heaven. He departed from our sight so that we should turn to our hearts and find him there. He departed, but he is here with us. He would not stay long with us, but he did not leave us. He went back to the place which he had never left, because he, through whom the world was made, was in the world, and he came into the world to save sinners. To him my soul confesses, and he is its healer because the wrong it did was against him. Great ones of the world, will your hearts always be hardened? Your life has come down from heaven. Will you not now at last rise with him and live? But how can you rise if you are in high places and your clamor reaches heaven? Come down from those heights, for then you may climb and this time climb to God. To climb against him was your fall. My soul, tell this to the souls that you love. Let them weep in this valley of tears, and so take them with you to God. For if, as you speak, the flame of charity burns in you, it is by his spirit that you tell them this. Confessions 13 I did not know this then. I was in love with beauty of a lower order, and it was dragging me down. I used to ask my friends, do we love anything unless it is beautiful? What then is beauty, and in what does it consist? What is it that attracts us and wins us over to the things we love? Unless there were beauty and grace in them, they would be powerless to win our hearts. When I looked at things, it struck me that there was a difference between the beauty of an object considered by itself as one whole and the beauty to be found in a proper proportion between separate things, such as the due balance between the whole of the body and any of its limbs, or between the foot and the shoe with which it is shod, and so on. This idea burst from my heart like water from a spring. My mind was full of it, and I wrote a book called Beauty and Proportion in two or three volumes as far as I remember. You know how many there were, O oh Lord. I have forgotten, because by some chance the book was lost and I no longer have it. Confessions 14 O oh Lord my God, what induced me to dedicate my book to Hyrius, the great public speaker at Rome? I had never even seen him, but I admired his brilliant reputation for learning and had been greatly struck by what I had heard of his speeches. Even more than this, I was impressed by the admiration which other people had for him. They overwhelmed him with praise because it seemed extraordinary that a man born in Syria and originally trained to speak in Greek had later become so remarkable a speaker in Latin and had also such a wealth of knowledge of the subjects studied by philosophers. We can admire persons whom we have never seen, if we hear them praised, though this does not mean that simply to hear their praises will make us admire them. But enthusiasm in one man will kindle the same fire in another, for we admire the person whose praises we hear only if we believe that they are sincerely uttered, in other words, that the person who utters them genuinely admires the man whom he praises. In those days I admired people in this way, according to the judgments I heard of them from others, not according to your judgment, my God, in whom no one is deceived. But I did not admire Hyrius in the way that I might have admired a famous charioteer or a popular contestant in the amphitheatre. My feeling for him and others like him was quite different. It was something quite serious, the kind of admiration that I should have liked to win for myself. Why was this? Though I liked actors and openly admired them, I should not have wanted their fame and popularity for myself. I would rather have been entirely unknown than known in the way that they were known. I would rather have been hated than loved as they were. 
How can one soul contain within itself feelings so much at variance, in such conflict with each other? How does it balance them in the scale? Suppose that I like a certain quality in another man. Is it not inconsistent to loathe it in myself and reject it, since this can only mean that I detest it? Yet both of us are human beings. A man may admire a fine horse without wishing to be one himself, assuming that such a thing were possible. But with the actor the case is different, because both admirer and admired share the same nature. Can I then love in another what I should hate in myself? Though both of us are human. Man is a great mystery, Lord. You even keep count of the hairs on his head, and not one of them escapes your reckoning. Yet his hairs are more easily counted than his feelings and the emotions of his heart. But Hyrius was the kind of man in whom I admired qualities that I would have been glad to possess. In my pride I was running adrift at the mercy of every wind. You were guiding me as a helmsman steers a ship, but the course you steered was beyond my understanding. I know now and confess it as the truth that I admired Hyrius more because others praised him than for the accomplishments for which they praised him. I know this because those same people, instead of praising him, might have abused him. They might have spoken of the same talents in him but found fault with them and despised them. If they had done this, my feelings would not have been aroused nor my admiration kindled. Yet his qualities would have been the same, and he himself would have been no different. The only difference would have been in their attitude towards him. We can see from this that the soul is weak and helpless unless it clings to the firm rock of truth. Men give voice to their opinions, but they are only opinions, like so many puffs of wind that waft the soul hither and thither and make it veer and turn. The light is clouded over and the truth cannot be seen, although it is there before our eyes. I thought it a matter of much importance to myself to bring my book and the work I had done to the notice of this great man. If he had approved of them, my fervour would have been all the more ardent. If he had found fault, my heart, which was empty and bereft of God's firm truth, would have suffered a cruel blow. Yet I found pleasure in giving my mind to the problem of beauty and proportion, the work which I had dedicated to him. Although I found no others to admire it, I was proud of it myself. Confessions 15 But I still did not see that the pivot upon which this important matter turns is the fact that it is all of your making, Almighty God. For you do wonderful deeds as none else. My thoughts ranged only amongst material forms. I defined them in two classes, those which please the eye because they are beautiful in themselves and those which do so because they are properly proportioned in relation to something else. I drew this distinction and illustrated it from material examples. I also gave some thought to the nature of the soul, but my misconception of spiritual things prevented me from seeing the truth although it forced itself upon my mind, if only I would see it. Instead, I turned my pulsating mind away from the spiritual towards the material. I considered line and color and shape, and since my soul had no such visible qualities, I argued that I could not see it. I loved the peace that virtue brings and hated the discord that comes of vice. From this I concluded that in goodness there was unity, but in evil disunion of some kind. It seemed to me that this unity was the seat of the rational mind and was the natural state of truth and perfect goodness, whereas the disunion consisted of irrational life, which I thought of as a substance of some kind, and was the natural state of the ultimate evil. I was misguided enough to believe that evil too was not only a substance, but itself a form of life, although I did not think it had its origin in you, my God, 
who are the origin of all things. I call the unity a monad, a kind of mind without sex, and the disunion a dyad, consisting of the anger that leads to crimes of violence and the lust that leads to the sins of passion. But I did not know what I was saying because no one had taught me and I had not yet found out for myself that evil is not a substance and man's mind is not the supreme good that does not vary. Crimes against other men are committed when the emotions which spur us to action are corrupt and rise in revolt without control. Sins of self-indulgence are committed when the soul fails to govern the impulses from which it derives bodily pleasure. In the same way, if the rational mind is corrupt, mistaken ideas and false beliefs will poison life. In those days, my mind was corrupt. I did not know that if it was to share in the truth, it must be illuminated by another light, because the mind itself is not the essence of truth. For it is you, Lord, that keep the lamp of my hopes still burning and shine on the darkness about me. We have all received something out of your abundance. For you are the true light which enlightens every soul born into the world, because with you there can be no change, no swerving from your course. I was struggling to reach you, but you thrust me back so that I knew the taste of death. For you thought the proud. And what greater pride could there be then to assert, as I did in my strange madness, that by nature I was what you are. I was changeable, and I knew it, for if I wanted to be a learned man, it could only mean that I wanted to be better than I was. All the same, I prefer to think that you too were changeable rather than suppose that I was not what you are. This was why you thrust me back and crushed my rearing pride while my imagination continued to play on material forms. Myself, a man of flesh and blood, I blamed the flesh. I was as fickle as a breath of wind, unable to return to you. I drifted on, making my way towards things that had no existence in you, or in myself, or in the body. They were not created for me by your truth, but were the inventions of my own foolish imagination working on material things. Though I did not know it, I was in exile from my place in God's city among his faithful children, my fellow citizens. But I was all words, and stupidly I used to ask them, if, as you say, God made the soul, why does it err? Yet I did not like them to ask me in return, if what you say is true, why does God err? So I used to argue that your unchangeable substance, my God, was forced to err, rather than admit that my own was changeable and erred of its own free will, and that its errors were my punishment. At the time when I wrote the book, I was about 26 or 27 years old. Sweet truth, although I was straining to catch the sound of your secret melody, I deafened the ears of my heart by allowing my mind to twist and turn among these material inventions of my imagination. As I pondered over beauty and proportion, all the time I wanted to stand still and listen to you and rejoice at hearing the bridegroom's voice, the voice of the bridegroom of my soul. But this I could not do, because the voice of my own error called me away from him and I was dragged down and down by the weight of my own pride. You sent me no tidings of good news and rejoicing, nor did my body thrill with pride, for it had not been laid in the dust. Confessions 16 When I was only about 20 years of age, Aristotle's book on the Ten Categories came into my hands. Whenever my teacher at Carthage and others who were reputed to be scholars mentioned this book, their cheeks would swell with self-importance, so that the title alone was enough to make me stand agape, as though I were poised over some wonderful divine mystery. I managed to read it and understand it without help, though I now ask myself what advantage I gained from doing so. Other people told me that they had understood it only with difficulty, after the most learned masters had not only explained it to them but also illustrated it 
with a wealth of diagrams. But when I discussed it with them, I found that they could tell me no more about it than I had already discovered by reading it on my own. The meaning of the book seemed clear enough to me. It defines substance, such as man, and its attributes. For instance, a man has a certain shape. This is quality. He has height, measured in feet, which is quantity. He has relation to other men. For example, he is another man's brother. You may say where he is and when he was born, or describe his position as standing or sitting. You may name his possessions by saying that he has shoes or carries arms. You may define what he does and what is done to him. I have mentioned these examples, but there are countless others, all falling into these nine categories or the main category of substance. What profit did this study bring me? None. In fact, it made difficulties for me because I thought that everything that existed could be reduced to these ten categories. And I therefore attempted to understand you, my God, in all your wonderful, immutable simplicity in these same terms, as though you two were substance, and greatness and beauty were your attributes in the same way that a body has attributes by which it is defined. But your greatness and beauty are your own self, whereas a body is not great or beautiful simply because it is a body. It will still be a body, even if it were less great or less beautiful. My conception of you was quite untrue, a mere falsehood. It was a fiction based on my own wretched state, not the firm foundation of your bliss. It was your command that the ground should yield me thorns and thistles, and that I should earn my bread with the sweat of my brow. And your word was accomplished in me. I read and understood by myself all the books that I could find on the so-called liberal arts, for in those days I was a good-for-nothing and a slave to sordid ambitions. But what advantage did I gain from them? I read them with pleasure, but I did not know the real source of such true and certain facts as they contained. I had my back to the light, and my face was turned towards the things which it illumined so that my eyes, by which I saw the things which stood in the light, were themselves in darkness. Without great difficulty and without need of a teacher, I understood all that I read on the arts of rhetoric and logic, on geometry, music and mathematics. You know this, O Lord my God, because if a man is quick to understand and his perception is keen, he has these gifts from you. But since I made no offering of them to you, it did me more harm than good to struggle to keep in my own power so large a part of what you had given to me, and instead of preserving my strength for you, to leave you and go to a far country to squander your gifts on loves that sold themselves for money. For what good to me was my ability if I did not use it well? And ability I had. For until I tried to instruct others, I did not realize that these subjects are very difficult to master. Even for pupils who are studious and intelligent, and a student who could follow my instruction without faltering was reckoned a very fine scholar. But what value did I gain from my reading as long as I thought that you, Lord God, who are the truth, were a bright, unbounded body and I a small piece broken from it? What utter distortion of the truth! Yet this was my belief, and I do not now blush to acknowledge, my God, the mercies you have shown to me, nor to call you to my aid, just as in those days I did not blush to declare my blasphemies aloud and snarl at you like a dog. What then was the value to me of my intelligence, which could take these subjects in its stride and all those books with their tangled problems, which I unraveled without the help of any human tutor, when in the doctrine of your love I was lost in the most hideous error and the vilest sacrilege. And was it so great a drawback to your faithful children that they were slower than I to understand such things? For they did not forsake you, but grew like fledglings in the safe nest of your church, nourishing the wings of charity on the food of the faith that would save them. O Lord our God, 
Let the shelter of your wings give us hope. Protect us and uphold us. You will be the support that upholds us from childhood till the hair on our heads is grey. When you are our strength, we are strong, but when our strength is our own, we are weak. In you, our good abides forever, and when we turn away from it, we turn to evil. Let us come home at last to you, O Lord, for fear that we be lost. For in you our good abides, and it has no blemish, since it is yourself. Nor do we fear that there is no home to which we can return. We fell from it, but our home is your eternity, and it does not fall because we are away. <laughs>